Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and I have Adam here as my co-host. Hey, Andy. Uh, looking forward to today's conversation. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. We're going to take a break from all of the technical stuff that we've been talking about and bring you an episode on how to get into information security and a little bit about career progression. We're going to talk about our career path and what has led us to where we are now and some advice for fledgling information security professionals and even some seasoned pros. A lot of people think that you need to have a programming or computer science background to get into cybersecurity. And I believe that you can get into cybersecurity coming from any type of background. Starting with education, Adam, what did you major in in college? So I went to Iowa State University, which is the birthplace of the digital computer, by the way. And it's a really strong engineering school and very strong computer science program as well. So naturally, I majored in business. My degree is in management information systems. And so usually at Iowa State, at least, MIS is seen as the place you go when you fail out of computer science. I was an exception in that I was not a computer science dropout. I chose that degree from the get-go. And I would recommend it to just about anyone because one of the things I like about MIS, at least the way it's taught at most schools, is that it's part of the College of Business. And so my junior and senior level classes, I had to go through every single focus area for the College of Business. So I had to take a 300 level class in finance and a 300 level class in logistics, a 300 level class in operations and management and marketing. So that was honestly amazing to have that business background because I could speak finance. I could read financial reports. I could speak marketing. I understood management. And that's really, really helpful when you understand how a job in information technology or information security can enable the business and how you can speak their language and get through to them. So not a degree that pops top of mind when people think about, hey, I want to go into something like information security, but I would definitely recommend an MIS program to just about anyone, especially if at the university or college you're looking at, it's it's part of the College of Business, because the well-roundedness of my degree, I think, was really valuable. When I went to school and I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, there wasn't a cybersecurity program. And in fact, when I started there, there wasn't even a degree-granting program for computer engineering. Computer engineering was a minor for electrical engineering. So I ended up majoring in electrical engineering, even though my interest was in computers. And engineering, I think the greatest skill that it taught me was problem solving. While there were a lot of courses in programming, the biggest skill that I took out of it was learning how to look at a problem and find a solution for it. So after you graduated, Adam, what was your first job out of college and how did you progress from there to where you are today? I graduated right after the financial crisis. So fall of 2008 is when everything kind of started going downhill. And I graduated the following spring, so May of 2009. And I was very, very fortunate, because a lot of people couldn't find work at all, that I was able to go to work for IBM. And anybody who's a technologist who's listening to this show probably at least knows IBM in theory. It was amazing, by the way, this is a total side note, how many of my peers at the time didn't even know who IBM was. And that's... uh, Uh, That's just an interesting anecdote there that one of the companies that created the PC industry is now not well known. Anyhow, I was doing backup and recovery for IT delivery. So companies that had outsourced their IT to IBM. And I did that for a little while. It wasn't my favorite job. And and I went on to kind of a generalist IT professional kind of help desk kind of role at a, a smaller insurance brokerage here in West Des Moines and did that for a couple of years and then got the itch to move on again. And I made a career mistake. And by the way, this is something y'all can learn from. I thought I wanted to do something different and I interviewed for a job and they kept asking me questions about what I had done at IBM. Well, I didn't like my job at IBM. So this should have been a red 
flag to me that if they're curious about my work experience there, they're going to ask me to do more of the same sort of thing. So I took this job where I was going to be a IT analyst helping to manage an IBM WebSphere environment for a large financial services company here in Des Moines. And it was a huge mistake. And if you ever recognize that you've made a career mistake, the best thing to do is own it immediately. And I I definitely did. So after only three months there, um, I was very fortunate that I received a call for a really interesting position. What they were looking for was somebody who had background in mobile device management, which I did. I had done a BlackBerry migration. They were looking for somebody who knew Lotus Notes, which I had learned by accident by being at IBM. And they wanted somebody who was willing to learn Office 365. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. And remember, I hated my job at the time. So I went for it. And that was the job that set my whole career path in motion from there. And the number one thing that got me there in the first place was because the person who occupied that seat refused to learn something. They said, would you like to learn Office 365? I know we're Lotus Note shop today, but we're going to move to Exchange and Microsoft and all that. And the person said no. And so they showed them the door and brought me in because I was willing to learn. And I possess that kind of unique mixture of skills. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I became an accidental Exchange administrator, learned Office 365 by doing, which is not the best way to do it, but I did. And uh, from there, stayed there several years, four or five years, and then went to another company to do basically the same thing, to kind of help stand up their Office 365 infrastructure, smooth it out and get it running with the same operational efficiency we had before. Because by the time all was said and done, we had this really solid environment. And what I had kind of learned by accident while doing all of that were things like identity, managing identities, Azure Active Directory, on-premises Active Directory, synchronizing them, uh, things like conditional access, things like device management through Microsoft Intune, and how that ties in with the email system. And so I was learning all of these different things, and I got the attention of my Microsoft account team. And they asked me if I wanted to come work for Microsoft. Well, anybody who knew me at the time knew I was kind of a, a raging Apple fanboy. I actually had worked for Apple for a period of time. I sold Macs when I was in college, and I was dumbfounded that somebody would want me to come work for Microsoft. But I had recognized that it was really a different company today. And so after thinking it over and talking to people close to me, I decided to go for it. And the other thing about this job that was so different is this was technical sales. So I had gone from IT, like keeping systems operational, up and running, deploying new projects, new technologies, to instead selling technology. And that was a totally different ballgame. But what made Microsoft confident in my ability to do that was how I had interacted with the Microsoft account team. And I was able to show them kind of through a personal portfolio, some lunch and learns I had done where I had presented technical topics and trained non-technical audiences on them. And that really got their attention. So I came to Microsoft and I was selling what they called at the time enterprise mobility and security, which is really more focused on things like identity, device management, and information protection. And as things have evolved at Microsoft over the years, and they've gotten more effortful on some of the more threat protection focused tools, I started picking those up as well. So really, I didn't even see myself as somebody who was involved with information security at all. I thought, I'm just managing iPhones. I'm just managing Android devices. I'm just managing identities. But it turns out those are absolutely information security focused things. And then I was able to pick up other things along the way. And so now I've been at Microsoft almost four years. I've been promoted to senior technical specialist and have had a lot of success doing the technical sales thing. And along the way, Microsoft has invested in me. We can take any Microsoft-focused exams for free. So I've completed all of the Microsoft security-focused exams for Microsoft 365. They paid for me to do Certified Ethical Hacker. And we'll talk about certs a little later. But it's just really amazing that I kind of fell into almost everything that happened to me along my career, where it was just a matter of being willing to learn new things, being willing to use soft skills to help share the love of technology with others. And and always saying yes to new opportunities. And it's not like I didn't make missteps along the way. It's not like I didn't make a bad choice or two career-wise because I did. But the sooner you recognize it and the more upfront and honest you are with everyone around you, the better off you'll be. And so today, I talk to information security professionals all day long. That's that's who I talk to. And I'm trying to help them understand the benefits of all of Microsoft's different security tools. And I, I think that's true of a lot of people is they're going to have stories where they became 
became like in information security by accident. And that's perfectly okay. I think we need more people that have different backgrounds and, and don't come from like a traditional background where you thought from day one that that's what you wanted to do. The more diversity of thought, diversity of background we have, the better off we'll be. So Andy, what's kind of your story and how did you wind up where you are today? My story is very different. When I got out of college, I was in ROTC and I commissioned as an officer in the Air Force. So for my first job, I was selected to be a strike nav, which is a weapon system officer similar to like Goose in Top Gun. And so I, I started flying with the Air Force, went to flight school. You know, flying in the military teaches you a lot of different skills, including attention to detail. When you're flying, there's a lot of checklists that you need to go through very carefully because if you miss a step, that could mean the difference between the plane flying and the plane crashing. And so we do a lot of planning. There's a lot of downtime where you're going over your charts, going over your flight plan, and then walking around the plane, going through the checklist before you even fly. I won't get into the details of what led me to change, but I ended up changing to the engineering program within the Air Force. So I did that for a while and then I came off active duty and my first job as a reservist was the emergency management flight commander in a civil engineering squadron. And this was right after 9-11, a few years after 9-11. And what we learned as a country after 9-11 was our emergency incident response program was a mess communications between local law enforcement, local EMS, and federal resources, state resources, was all discombobulated. No one talked on the same frequency. No one used the same acronyms. And so after 9-11, an organization called the National Incident Management System was formed called NIMS. And that's where the concept of the EOC that we talked about, the Emergency Operations Center, Mm -hmm. was born. And so now that term, the EOC, is used at the state level, at the county level, even at the University of Wisconsin, they have an EOC. So every organization that uses the NIMS system for emergency management has the same terminology. So that was a really great experience for me because as the emergency management flight commander, I led incident response at the base level. So when there was an incident from bioterrorism, major aircraft emergencies, active shooters, I was the one who was leading the EOC and communicating with the executive management team who was off-site. So I would convey in the messages from the incident commander who was on scene, organize resources within the EOC, and then communicate to the executive team. And those are all skills that can translate to cybersecurity and a cyber attack, as we talked about last week. So I came off of active duty, and then I went and worked for a manufacturing company where I was a supervisor for unionized workers. We were implementing quality control practices, good manufacturing practices. And I think there I learned more just how to lead people, how to motivate them, how to connect with people. Because as a supervisor, your job is to make sure that your subordinates are doing their job. That was more of a lesson in management. And I got a lot of that in the Air Force too, in leadership training as an officer. And my time at that manufacturing company was interrupted when I had to deploy to Afghanistan. So I deployed with my unit, the Civil Engineering Squadron, to Afghanistan. And I was second in command of a 56-man team. And we did construction projects in a war zone. And the same thing, leading folks and making sure that they're motivated and doing their job under a very, very stressful situation. So when I came back from Afghanistan, I kind of wanted to do something different. And so I applied for a bunch of different agencies and got accepted at one of our local law enforcement agencies to be a police officer. And police officers learn a lot of different skills, but one of them is obviously investigating crime. One of the things that I took from there as experience is, you know, how to ask the right questions during an incident and how to successfully complete an investigation, which is essentially what cybersecurity and incident response is. If, if there is an incident, you have to respond, you have to figure it out, what happened, and then how to resolve it. And then after law enforcement, I went into sales at Best Buy. I was one of the sales managers and then eventually became the Geek Squad manager. You know, we talked about soft skills before, but selling is an art and being able to talk to someone and convince them to buy something is the same type of skill that you would want to have inside of a company from an internal cybersecurity professional, you're kind of selling on the inside because you're seeing vulnerabilities and you have to convince people this is something that is a priority, that this is something that needs to be taken care of. And if it isn't taken care of, the risk of that can be really great. I think everyone should do some time at retail. It's super valuable. I think a lot of us in IT 
you know, family during Christmas and holidays will just ask you like, hey, Adam, what do you think about the new iPhone? Mm -hmm. Or should I get an iPhone or an Android? Mm -hmm. You know, and you're essentially convincing them of your opinion, right? Which one you think is better? Should I get a MacBook or a Windows PC, right? Mm -hmm. I get asked that all the time. (laughs) So... Well, just and and retail as well. It, it teaches you how to deal with all sorts of different personalities, uh, varying levels of sometimes very stressful situations, escalated situations, and never knowing what you're going to get day to day too. You know, every day is really, really different. So I, I worked at Best Buy for two years as well. Now I was in the media department, which at the time was like music, movies, games, and software, but definitely did my time there too. And uh, also worked at Apple retail. So I think those were really valuable experiences, both one and more of my formative years when I was in high school and and early college. And then Apple retail was post-college, like a year out of college. And Apple retail is really interesting as well, because you learn so many customer services service skills at Apple. They do a really, really nice job of that. And, you know, I took away some of the the ways they taught you to approach things. So two interesting takeaways I have, and and Andy, I know I'm interrupting your story, but I want to hear more about your career path, but just as long as you brought it up. So one is being very open to saying when you don't know and being honest about that. At Apple, they really encouraged you to be able to tell a customer, I don't know, let's find out together. And I have carried that with me my whole career. It's such a simple phrasing, but not only does it show that it's okay to not know things, but then the second half of that, let's find out together, is such a growth mindset kind of concept. And so I love that. The other one that's maybe less interesting is, as you can imagine at Apple, there's a lot of delivering of bad news when a customer has a storage device fail in their MacBook and they potentially lost photos that are irreplaceable or their iPhone or whatever. And this is just more of an interesting anecdote. Uh, The way they teach you to talk about that is is to do it in a way that doesn't imply fault. So the phrasing generally we would use would be something to the effect of, ma'am, as it turns out, the hard drive in this MacBook has failed. And so that phrasing, like, as it turns out, suggests that it's just the nature of the universe that the hard drive has given out. And there's no, like, your MacBook or your hard drive has failed because that kind of implies fault. When you use those very generic pronouns, it really changes how that conversation comes off. So... It sounds so simple, but when it's something you do all day, every day, you get really good at it. And those are just a couple of examples of things where retail helped me long term in my career. So I love that you did time at retail as well. That's awesome. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's all right. I, I think Best Buy is one of those companies that is great to learn those skills at. You know, you're you're interacting with people and their geek squad. You can say what you want about the level of service. You know, maybe you haven't had a great experience with them, but if you work there, they have the ARAs, which are the advanced repair agents in the back that actually do the repairs and you learn a lot about hardware software how to fix computers and that can directly translate to a help desk at any major company Mm -hmm. and so and the people that are bringing in their machines to get fixed a lot of that is malware it's a lot of cybersecurity incident response and how to remediate that I learned a lot while I was there. I knew a little bit about fixing computers just in my personal life already. But when you're doing it all day, every day, you get very, very good at it. And so I ended up going to another company, a manufacturing company here in Wisconsin, where I started out at their help desk. And the first day, the manager was like, well, we need someone who is really, really good with Macs because we don't have anyone who is good at Macs. So can you be our guy to fix all the Macs that come in? And this is a lesson that that guy who was at your company who didn't want to learn Office 365, he said, nope. That's a good lesson to learn in any IT job is if someone asks you if you want to be the person to do something, the answer is yes. Yes, it definitely is. So when my manager asked me, I want you to be the Apple guy, can you do that? My answer was yes. And I felt comfortable with Apple, but you know, I wasn't an expert. And so, you know, that leads me to one of my other points is you don't have to be an expert, but you definitely have to be open to learn and you have to be able to look up information on how to do something because people around you may not be experts. So you got to be able to find that information. So I became the Mac guy at the company and obviously I worked with Windows as well. And I was working on my master's degree at the time for cybersecurity and 
expressed interest in that. And my manager supported me in that. And they were starting out their cybersecurity program. They had one cybersecurity engineer. And so I basically hung out with him, learned as much as I could. As soon as there was an opening and I finished my master's, they moved me over into cybersecurity. And I did that for a few years. And my hiring manager at that company went to Microsoft as an Azure technical specialist. And, you know, I kept in contact with him, ended up working up for Microsoft for a little while, about a year and a half. And that's where I met you, Adam. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we were in the same role where we were essentially doing technical sales. And man, I tell you, if you get the chance to work at Microsoft, even if you spend a year, two years, the experience that you get there is worth 10 years at, at an IT company. I learned a ton while I was there, a lot about Microsoft technologies. And then now I'm at Exact Sciences, which is a biotech company and, and just doing information security defense. So, and learning a lot again, because I think when you're at Microsoft, you think everyone should be using Microsoft, which is obviously their goal. But when you're at a company, sometimes you have to mix in other technologies. And one of the things that I've learned is when you're on the vendor side, everything is cutting edge and it's exciting and, and everything is very fast paced. But when you're in IT, at a corporate company, things are very, very slow. There's change management, there's politics to, that get in the way, user experience, migrations, third-party tools. And so it takes a long time to get something done. And you have to have a lot of perseverance in cybersecurity to do that. So we talked about some of the skills that you need in cybersecurity, but I believe, as Adam has said, I think anyone can get into cybersecurity no matter what your background is. Traditionally, network engineers have been cybersecurity, but I I think if you come from an infrastructure side, help desk, learning, patch management, that's all very, very important. And you can be a great at cybersecurity and transition from infrastructure. If you're a coder, scripter, programming, that translates well into certain aspects of cybersecurity. And I think one of the most underrated skills in cybersecurity is project management because at major corporations, every time you implement a solution, it takes a long time. It's not something you just flip on. You take time to test it, to configure it, implement it, and that can take months. And it takes someone who's really good at project management, reaching out to different areas of the business and coordinating all of that to be successful. One of the things that reminds me of what you're talking about with project management is the movie Old School from 2003. And there's kind of a funny bit in there that these guys are a bunch of kind of wannabe frat boys in their 30s and 40s, but they're really good at paperwork. And that's kind of an ongoing joke throughout the film is they don't expect these guys to be good at paperwork, but they're really good at dotting their I's and crossing their T's. And anyhow, I bring that up because this is something where you can differentiate yourself in your career. You are going to have to deal with corporate funny business and moving through the processes of corporate America, or even worse, God bless you if you're in like academia, which is corporate America on steroids, because there's even more committees and processes and paperwork and all that crap. If you can turn that from something that you see as holding you back to something you can master, you will make yourself infinitely valuable because you will always have to navigate that. So as opposed to grousing about it and complaining about the process or the paperwork or anything else, Else, become the best person on your team at knowing how to navigate that. And you will deliver so much value because you will be able to deftly maneuver through all of that and get things done faster than anybody else. And if you're not spending time complaining about it, that's more time you can spend on implementing it. So just something to think about and, and turn that on its head for sure. As you talk about things like project management and, and navigating the process of getting technology implemented and deployed. And soft skills, you know, as we said before, are extremely important in cybersecurity. So working on writing and speaking. And I think one of those skills, as I mentioned, is just never giving up, being tenacious about convincing people that they need to shore up their, their defenses, take care of a risk, take care of a vulnerability, never being satisfied. Because I'll tell you, there is never a day that goes by where I sit back and I'm like, yep, my company's safe. All my defenses are deployed. I don't have to worry about anything happening. In cybersecurity, you know, we assume breach. So you have to be tenacious at really finding and solving problems every single day. And you have to be able to learn quickly. If I ask somebody a question that I don't know, someone who's smarter than me, if they take the time to answer it and explain it to me, I take the time to make sure that I learn it right then and there because everyone's time is valuable. And so if I am taking time out of someone's day for them to educate me, the least I can do is make sure 
sure that I learn it. And if I don't learn it, I write it down. I look it up later on. Maybe I ask a follow on question, but definitely make sure that I'm not wasting their time. One of the things I still run into frequently, and this honestly surprises me, but I, again, I talk to information security professionals across enterprise sized organizations all day. That's, that's what I do for a living. I still see a ton of fixed mindset, know-it-alls as opposed to learn-it-alls. And I don't know why this is such a widespread phenomenon with information security professionals, but so many of them have it all figured out, have already secured their company, mission accomplished, and they're not willing to entertain anything that challenges their mindset. And it's it's, it's really widespread. And it's honestly really frustrating. You got to have that growth mindset. You have to have the mindset that you want to learn it all and not that you know it all and be open to new ideas and new concepts because this this industry changes so quickly and you have to be prepared to keep up with it. So that's a big one for me. And that's something I run into a lot. And you will run into these types of people and you're not going to be able to fix them. So just focus on yourself and make sure that anytime you detect yourself being closed off to new ideas or new experiences, adjust your mindset and be be open to new things. That's That's my number one piece of advice from what I see as I talk to people. And one of the other skills that I think is really important is being able to be calm under pressure because cybersecurity is very stressful, especially if there's an incident and not everyone can handle that. You know, I, I equate it to other high stress positions in other professions, like for physicians, not every physician wants to be a surgeon. Not all pilots want to fly F-16. Some people just want to kick back and fly a 747. And that's the same thing with IT folks. Not everyone has the mindset to be calm and collected during a cyber incident or wants to be in information security. We still need people who just want to keep the lights on sometimes, and that's okay. We need that steady hand too. Absolutely. So in cybersecurity, certifications comes up a lot, and I won't go through all the different certifications. Some of them are helpful. Um, There's a lot of different opinions within the community about what certs are good. For the most part, if you're learning, I think there are a couple base certs that are good to study for and have because it gives you kind of the base mindset and education that you need for a lot of the terminology that's used in the industry. A lot of employers will pay for you to take the certs or pay for the education to study for the certs. But just a few that I think are good, you know, if you're starting out, the CompTIA Security Plus is a very good basic one. That's the one that a lot of people take when they're first starting out. Adam mentioned the Certified Ethical Hacker. I think that's one that is a little bit more difficult. You'll see in the HR postings and job postings that a lot of people ask for the CISSP cert. That is not a beginner cert. That is definitely more of a management cert. It has broad concepts across all the realms of cybersecurity, including physical security, infrastructure, disaster recovery. The information that you need to know is wide, but the depth is not very, very deep. So Security Plus and Certified Ethical Hacker have much more technical depth to it, whereas the CISSP has much more broad knowledge, but not a lot of technical depth. The Offensive Security Certified Professional, or OSCP, that's kind of like the gold standard for pen testers and red teams. And then, you know, there's a couple other ones. If you're on the networking side, I'm sure you're familiar with the Cisco certs like CCNA and CCNP. Those are obviously very good for network experience and knowledge. And then there's some other ones, like Adam mentioned, he has passed the Microsoft ones, like the MS500. That's the Microsoft Security Fundamentals, and that is very good for Microsoft Security. But, you know, if you're starting off, I would definitely start with the more general technical ones like Security Plus and Certified Ethical Hacker than to just jump into like the MS500. That's my opinion. CISSP for all its faults is still kind of the gold standard. I see it in a lot of listings. I know even inside of Microsoft, there's still a desire to make you have it to get go into certain roles. So for all its failings, there's still a ton of value there. I'm not a big certs guy personally. There's some they have their time and place for sure, um, but they're they're not going to be a replacement for experience. So they're not going to really shortcut your career or anything else. What they might do is open additional doors once you've already 
kind of built the experience level. Um, but I don't think they'll catapult you beyond where where you would be just because you don't necessarily have the experience. You kind of everyone's got to cut their teeth in this business, unfortunately or fortunately, um, and kind of grow from there. And then the other thing too, Andy, I'm curious your take on this. Should you put your certs in your name field on LinkedIn? Because I vote heck no. I do not put my certs in my name field. Ugh. I know a lot of people do, but Ugh, I can't I do stand not. that. Not a fan. There is a certifications field on LinkedIn where you can publish all of that stuff. And, and mine is definitely populated uh, with my certified ethical hacker and all my Microsoft certs, but they're not in my name. I'm not going to look down on anyone who does, but that's not something that I do. <laughs> I, will, I will look down on you. I don't like it, but it's okay. I'm not the one hiring you. So. I would also recommend that while you're employed at a company to look into if your employer will pay for continued education. I used a program with my previous company to have them help offset and pay for a percentage of my master's degree. So that is very helpful. And they can do that for certifications. They can do that for associate degrees, bachelors, if you're working on those. And that is one of the biggest career advancement advice that I can give to anyone is look into your employer's HR programs, I guarantee you if it's a big enough company, they're going to have some tuition assistance program and use that to fund your next degree. When we're talking about information security, it is such a broad career field. There's so many different types, such as blue teaming that you know Adam and I focus on, where we're focused on enterprise defense, security engineers, security architects. There's also red team, where there's pen testers. One of the most interesting subfields that have come out of this recently is bug bounty. There's a site called HackerOne.com where anyone, even if you're just doing it at night for a couple hours, if you're good at finding vulnerabilities in different products, different operating systems, website vulnerabilities. You can make a living or even just pad your income by finding bugs in different products. Google has a bug bounty program. Microsoft has a bug bounty program. All these companies will pay you know, a couple thousand dollars to even tens of thousands of dollars for a single bug submission. You can make a living just doing that. Not only can you make a living, I think that this is one of the most noble things you can do. Because if you are finding bugs and you are properly disclosing them to software and hardware vendors, you are keeping those vulnerabilities away from companies like Celebrite, uh, which I won't wade into those waters on this conversation, but ask my opinion about that sometime, um, or foreign adversaries as well, or heck, even the United States government. You are getting those properly disclosed so they can be fixed and they can't be exploited by not only bad actors, but maybe, you know, gray hat actors that might be government agencies or, or agencies that assist law enforcement or anything else. There's a lot of benefits to, to getting those bugs properly disclosed. So I love, love, love our security researchers that get those out there, get them properly disclosed and get them fixed so they can't be exploited by anyone. Obviously, I'm partial to technical sales. That's kind of the career I fell into. This is really interesting because you still need to have a technical depth in understanding the products and the threats and be able to explain them to other technical people. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to come to an agreement that your product that you represent as a vendor will meet the technical requirements for an organization. And you don't necessarily have to involve yourself in negotiating or discounting or talking products price or earning contracts or anything else. Usually you are partnered with somebody else who does all of that stuff. So if you kind of think sales is this gross thing that you don't want to do, just know that there's a way to be persuasive while still, still spending most of your time just talking about technology. And you're not responsible for um, a lot of the parts that you may not find as attractive, like negotiating and talking pricing and, and doing all those sorts of things, prospecting. You don't have to do a lot of that in technical sales. They kind of come to you and tell you where to go and what to do. And the other thing too, this will depend on where you would go to work, but in a lot of places, technical sellers are mostly salaried. So that's the case for me at Microsoft. The majority of my income is salary. I, I make a very good living on my salary alone. So if I get no bonus payouts at all, I'm still very comfortable. That's all kind of gravy. So I know there's, there's kind of a hesitance to go into that based on kind of what people think the other information security roles are like, but if you are good 
good with people and you are good at explaining things to people and you can be persuasive and you're not afraid of being told no, because you will definitely get plenty of that. Um, that's, that's an interesting career to go into. And there's a whole industry around that sort of thing around vendor sales. So consulting, you know, Microsoft and all these other information security providers, they need consultants that can go help solve problems for customers that can go into organizations and tell them how to properly configure their Active Directory or their Azure Active Directory or their endpoint protection solution. And same thing with implementation partners, companies that can go in and actually be those hands on the keyboard and say, here's how you properly deploy this technology, this cloud access security broker, or this information protection solution. So there's a whole industry. If you are really good at helping people start to use a tool or a set of products around selling and deploying software that doesn't have to involve kind of sitting at the same company and securing it, you can help secure a lot of companies um, in that kind of role and still be contributing to the greater information security world. So those are a couple of roles I think that are interesting. And Andy, I think there are a couple others you wanted to mention as well. Yeah, I think one of the interesting subdomains of information security is app security or app sec. And that's definitely one of my weakest areas. I think you have to have a good computer programming background. If you're doing development, you probably will come from the development side and have a strong sense of security. And that is almost an oxymoron sometimes because a lot of developers just want to code and get the application working. Whereas it's hard to find developers who have that security mindset that want to code something securely and having that background and being able to analyze it and do it securely is something that is very rare in the industry. But if you are good at coding and you're in development, that is certainly a very, very good subdomain of information security that not a lot of people are good at. Incident response and threat hunting is a whole nother set of skills as well. I know that that kind of mixes in with defense, but architecture and engineering and deploying tools is very different than looking daily at alerts and threat hunting and having those tools. There's a whole set of tools that you need to look at IP addresses and endpoints and attribute those signals together and doing that investigation and responding that is completely different from deploying technology. And there's a whole nother aspect of cybersecurity that's also part of intelligence, threat modeling, social engineering. A lot of people People who are in open source intelligence or OSINT. Um, that's a whole aspect of information security that all it does is take a look at threat feeds and information that's out there and pieces it together so it's coherent. Like right now, there's a lot of OSINT that's out there that signals that healthcare companies and hospitals are under attack. It has been a really rough month for the entire healthcare industry because Ryuk is running rampant and hospitals are, are under attack. So that type of threat feed, there are people who specialized in that and kind of get that information out for defenders to kind of consume. Let's just wrap this up with a little bit of advice. We talked about making sure that if you're given the opportunity, definitely take the opportunity to learn if it's something new. I wouldn't say no to any opportunity. If someone's presenting me with a new tool and they ask me, hey, you want to learn about this? Definitely take the opportunity to do that. Every job you're in, every tool that you're using is an opportunity to learn a, a different set of skills. And if you're interested in cybersecurity and you're at a company, make sure that your manager or the cybersecurity team knows that you're interested because you can certainly cross train and maybe when a position opens up you can fill it in so find a mentor make sure that you know you're absorbing the information when you're asking questions and learning from that mentor you will often hear different statistics thrown out on the employment gap in information security. It is massive. If we could snap our fingers and have properly trained information security professionals tomorrow, we would need millions of them to fill all the open roles. So there is more than ample opportunity here to get in the game. When you do get in the game, make sure that you define a career path with the hiring manager ahead of time before even accepting the role. Or once you're in role, that's fine too. One of the things that I... I think is challenging in this business is especially in the incident response side of it. There is not really a clearly understood pathway to move from a tier one to tier two to tier three SOC analyst to manager to architect. A lot of that doesn't exist. A lot of that's not defined. And those roles can be very challenging as we've talked about on this show and other shows, the, the repetitiveness of the role, the stress of the role, everything else. So the 
least you can do is arm yourself and your manager with a plan for when I meet these criteria or these milestones, that's when we could consider a promotion to tier two SOC analyst or tier three SOC analyst. I know I'm focusing on that specifically, but that's just been a really challenge in the industry of developing that career path for people to move up the food chain as they demonstrate aptitude and skills. So kind of plan ahead on that. Think ahead on where you want to be and where you want to go. The other thing too is setting aside time for learning. Andy mentioned a couple of things you can do to to learn. Certainly, again, I'm talking about Microsoft mostly because that's what I'm familiar with. You can get in a complete demo environment of everything Microsoft sells, everything in the E5, which is like the top suite at no cost. You can have that for, uh, I think it's 90 days to poke around with. And when it dies, you could spin up another one. And so there is the opportunity to go get your hands on this stuff to actually try it out to experiment with it. And certainly that's something you can do after hours. And that's fine if you if you want to do it that way. But a good manager should support learning and ongoing learning as part of your job. And so getting the agreement that on Fridays, I'm going to block 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. to do ongoing learning is a good thing. So set something like that up as well and dedicate that to learning new stuff. Whether you're in InfoSec today or that's where you want to go, um, that's going to open up opportunities for you if you are able to competently speak to how you actually manage the tools or manage the alerts as they come in. Yeah, I certainly don't want to tell you what not to look for in an employer, but having a manager that supports you in continuing education and investing in their employees, a company that invests in their employees is worth its weight in gold. I'll never forget that when I started at my company, the second week I was there, I asked my manager if I could go to Microsoft Ignite, which is a very expensive conference. Mm -hmm. And there was no hesitancy. He said, absolutely. And it was funded for me. So, I mean, that type of support doesn't come easy. It's not cheap. It makes me extremely loyal to the company that's willing to invest in me. And, you know, the skills that I learn from, from the training, I'm going to apply at that company, right? I'm not going to take it somewhere else. But you could. That That's the great thing about training is that that's something you get to take with you. That's part of you. And that's part of your sales pitch, no matter where you go. And it, just look at this whole show. Go back on everything we've talked about. And it has come up over and over and over again. I talked about growth mindset. We talked about certifications. We talked about workplace education programs. We talked about looking at different roles, mentoring. It has been an ongoing subject here that continuing education is so, so important. And this is something that a good manager should be able to articulate upfront. What opportunities are there going to be for continuing education? Are you okay with me blocking time during the week to dedicate to that? Can you fund educational opportunities like conferences or classroom learning or online learning, certifications, all of that? This is so, so important in a business like this that is changing so rapidly and evolving so quickly all the time. If you are not set up to have ongoing learning, you're not going to be successful. So get agreement to it up front and take advantage of it. That's the other thing is your manager is not going to come to you and say, hey, I've got all this money burning a hole in my pocket. What do you want to spend it on? You may have to ask. You will have to ask. Uh, but if they agreed to it and, and they said that that was going to be part of the role, then hold them to it and make sure that gets spent. Because as you know how budgets work in organizations, if it doesn't get spent that year, you lose it the next year. So you and your manager should be incented to make sure you're using all of the continuing ed funds that hopefully your manager is set aside. So just doubling down on what Andy said, so, so, so important, especially, especially in information security. I hope this episode was helpful for everyone who's listening and you were able to take away some of our experiences and apply it in your own career. It was an episode that we were looking forward to recording and I know a lot of people have been asking about, so hopefully you enjoyed it. We're going to wrap things up. There's a link in our show notes to our voicemail. Leave us a voicemail or send us a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn if there's a security topic you want us to talk about or you have additional follow-up questions on this episode. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.